all the time. Uh, I have to tell you, I have to make a confession here. I started uh, the Pediatric Heart Program in Amrita Institute uh, 1998. And I became, uh, I, I, I started to do a lot of interventions. I set up the cath lab, I developed the new technique of closing PDAs and I was quite well known and felt very good about it and I attended a lot of these meetings. Uh, I was doing a large number of procedures, I started the ASG device in my region, I did started to do preterm PDAs, PDA stenting, etc. It gave me a high. But then at some point I started to think. You have slides or you talk the before? slides are here. Uh, ah, okay. There are a but case. Can, can we I just had uh, someone loaded it for me and it should be uh, in, it's not the 1450, it's this one. Uh, I think this is the one. It's M Yeah, this is the one. I got it. So I uh, have to tell you that sometime after I was maybe five years or six years into the program, I asked myself the question, is this the most important thing for my part of the world? I had to consciously shed my image as an interventionist. I decided I do not want to be identified as a pediatric cardiac intention, interventionist because I think it's not, it's coming in the way of me doing something meaningful for my region. So I, over a period of time, stopped attending these meetings. I'm here because of Omar, because I had to, I committed to Omar, so I'm coming here, but I don't attend interventional meetings, only because I think uh, this whole notion of combining structural and congenital interventions is fantastic, it's relevant to these parts of the world where you need the combined expertise, but it's coming in the way of progress in my part of the world. It's coming in the way of addressing the most important priorities and that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. So the agenda is really what are the most important priorities for children in low resource environments, what's the roadmap to address them and how should interventional services be developed in this context? What's the most relevant to our environment? So what are the most urgent priorities for children with heart disease globally? By globally, I mean the majority of the world's children. So let's ask the question, where do these children live? Where are, where does the majority of the world's population? Now you want to take a guess? Uh, I want you to give me a number for A, B, and C. Anybody, but I'm putting you because I can see you right there. Give me a number. What's the number in A? What percentage? 70% in A. B? 5%. C? The rest. Okay. You guys have got it wrong. And you need to, the answer is low income is 9%, middle income is 75%. That's the world's classification today. And high income is 16%. And all of you, are, anybody who is interested in global health and, and, and the state of health of the world today should read this book. It's one of the masterpieces that's come out of uh, this man from Sweden who's, it's a highly engaging book. And of course, if you go to his website called The Gap Minder, uh, I, I, you'd be thoroughly entertained and thoroughly informed. So he says that when he administered this questionnaire to a lot of people, most people did worse than chimpanzees. Chimpanzees could get one out of three right, but people did even worse than that. So that was very important to understand that we got our facts wrong about the world. We need to understand our world today. So where do the children live? I mean, you just see the area expand in proportion to where the number of people are the most. So you see India and China and Indonesia exploding. And you see Australia and New Zealand and Canada shrinking into oblivion. So this is the reality of the world today. And then if you take the distribution as per age, you compare India with uh, let's say United States, you realize the world's children, 90% of the world's children, 95% approximately, live in low and middle income countries. Now the second question, again I'm gonna ask you all, what is the rank order of congenital heart disease as a cause of infant mortality in middle income nations today? I'm gonna ask you to choose one of three. Let's take somebody from high income, let's, I'm sorry to, maybe Peter, have a go. 
what would you be your choice be a b or c i'm sorry to pin you down but that's not the idea the idea is to try and get your perception so you say c for middle income countries uh, so again you're wrong and i wanted to tell you a phenomenon that you think that has happened in middle income countries that none of you have sort of registered the infant mortality has come down to a fairly low level every part of the world has declined with infant mortality except the ones where there is conflict maybe parts of syria yemen or afghanistan but other than that it's declining and it's declining in africa it's declining everywhere as a result congenital heart disease has risen so this is the global burden of disease and now it's number 2 in middle sdi is socio demographic index which is mostly the middle income countries it's number 2 it was number 3 in 1990 it's number 2 and even in the low income countries it's number 8 so where i come from in kerala it's number 1 because infant mortality has already come down to 9 or 10 and there is there was nothing for congenital heart disease so we are looking at a situation where congenital heart disease has become unmasked globally now under these circumstances we like like to ha- have answer the third question which is what is the most important killer with congenital heart disease early mortality so this is a study from 1971 no more questions i'm going to give the answer straight away 1971 wonderful study you can't get it again because we don't do these studies anymore it's unethical to 56000 live births of babies with congenital heart disease and this is the story tetralogy of fallow 25% transposition 72% mortality truncus TAPVC 90% mortality and, and of course close to 100% with duct dependent situations so these diseases kill let's take another example so these are you know the cyanotic bad heart diseases let's take a simple relatively simple large vst what will happen to this baby one of two things right one the baby could have a bad pneumonia and die from it or become progressively undernourished and this is a striking image of a large vst in a child who just didn't grow and eventually could not be salvaged despite surgery versus you can have eyes and liver you can't you're not going to have the vsd closed down you're going to have one of these two that's going to happen to these people so the question then i'm going to ask you again now what saves most lives of infant children with congenital heart disease and i wish our surgeon was here today the surgeon from germany i don't don't see him so it'd be lovely to have maybe a few surgeons answer this question it's a no brainer really it's infant and newborn heart surgery it's a small minority majority of the babies it's infant and newborn heart surgery because the numbers the commonest disease at birth is transposition it's it's severe you know heart diseases it's tetralogy it's large vsts it's these are the diseases can only be fixed by the surgeon yes you can do a few infant infant interventions maybe 10% but 90% of babies that die in infancy need surgery period i can challenge i can ha- i can take any challenge on this question so so therefore let's look at the global situation with access to surgery this is the world's map with just access to surgery not even talking about heart surgery just surgery and the darker you get the lesser is the access the proportion of children without access close to 100% in in middle of africa surgery is relatively easy heart surgery is difficult infant heart surgery is really difficult and newborn heart surgery is at the pinnacle of health systems now that is really deficient so the truth is only 7% of the world's children have access to heart surgery and 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 in even in china where you think things have progressed the number of centers that you have for the population is way lower than united states you can see the difference in japan united states is an aberration but japan brazil russia they are, they are much better off than than india china and of course africa is really at the very worst so here's the situation in india so i came back in 1996 i set up a program in 1998 there were five programs with had the ability to do infant heart surgery and we were operating on 1.6% because i calculated it very easily the number of infant oxygenators sold and then we were operating on we were doing 1.3 1.6% of the babies 97 99% of the babies were dying 
or becoming inoperable. Now this has really progressed. We have 52 programs. It seems like we've really grown 10 times in terms of number of programs, but that's not translated into very much. We still have 90% of children not being operated. Now that is to me the biggest problem. And also there's a really bad distribution of centers. It's all mirroring human development where there's low infant mortality, you have lots of centers. And with parts of India that there are like sub-Saharan Africa, you have very little. So you still have a huge issue. And then there are, as a result, health system challenges in the care continuum. If you see, there's very poor awareness on how to make a diagnosis, hardly any echo expertise, especially in the poorly served areas, no regular newborn screening, very little prenatal screening, little awareness on treatment options. There are days when pediatricians will still tell you that, oh, it's a large VST, you can wait till you're 10 kilos. So that either the child dies or becomes inoperable. There is not enough centers. There is very little awareness on how to transport babies, how to stabilize babies. There are challenges with distances. There are costs of transport. And there's a huge shortfall of programs. And there's a failure to integrate pediatric heart care into universal, universal health care models, with some exceptions and a predominantly privatized care that results in a lot of out-of-pocket expense. So these are the challenges we live with. So I ask myself the question, what should be my prime focus as a pediatric cardiologist? Should it be on pursuing these things? Because then, by then, you know, when I started attending these meetings, these were the prime discussion areas. PFO closure, membranous VST became an epidemic, and then of course, we had all kinds of things listed out there versus this. And I just had a choice and I said, really, even though I can do interventions and I continue to do them, I think the focus has to move towards areas where I can make a substantiative difference. And I listed these as my priorities and, 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 and we as a group in our own institution did that and, and I'm going to tell you the story of what happened thereafter. So I have to tell you, this is a Japanese concept that I only now discovered, is that you need to be, you get the ultimate satisfaction or the ikigai when you combine these four elements. That is, you, you're good at something, you love doing it, you get paid for it, but that's relevant to the world or the population that you serve. So only when you have all this coming together that you really feel satisfied with your work. I'm not saying I am satisfied, I've gotten there, but I think unless we get all these elements together, we have this sense of dissatisfaction. So here are, with this I'll tell you what are the essential elements, the way we've tried to address it. I'm not sure we've been successful, but this is what we've done. Building a program. I think that's the most important thing, is to build a program that can deliver infant and newborn heart surgery with good outcomes find a way to keep costs down, bring about a shift in awareness in the region amongst pediatricians, amongst caregivers, amongst primary caregivers, build capacity, train people, and find ways to fund patient care. And finally, after all this, get your government on board. So this has been our roadmap. I will describe what we've done with this roadmap. Essentially, uh, this is sort of my model of comprehensive pediatric care. Not all elements need to be there in every center before you start taking care of babies, and we still don't have all the elements. Interestingly, we still don't have an intensivist, and it's all of us getting together to deliver intensive care. We don't have transplant. We don't have an adult congenital person. So we don't have many elements. We still sort of cross cover and manage. But then this is sort of the model, that we need to develop every limb of this model. And just giving you an example of what we did to develop our intensive care, uh, and I, I realized very beginning that I have to make our intensive care excellent. Only then would catheter intervention thrive. Only then would I be able to do newborn interventions. Only then would we, would we be able to deliver good outcomes. So this is what we did. But essence of this was focusing on nurse empowerment, nurse training, ICU leadership, do joining a quality improvement collaborative, establishing infection control. And so this is what translated into our are very good outcomes that we've had until very recently. So we just sharing you the results that we did. And, and believe me, all this was achieved without anything fancy. No new equipment was bought, but just by instituting QI. Uh, and, and so joining IQIC translated our surgical mortality coming down from 4.4% to 1.3%.
and I don't think we bought anything substantiative in terms of equipment at that point of time. Um, and and this is, these are the various uh, indices that we had. We had an in-hospital mortality, a 30-day mortality, and a standardized mortal mortality ratio benchmarked against other centers. The second real issue that we have had to challenge ourselves and we have to tackle these challenges is trying to sustain these kind of results in the face of the usual problems that we face. So we face comorbidities, shortcomings with transport, poor baby conditions when they arrive, low birth weight, undernutrition, multidrunk resistant bacteria, etc., etc. And that we have to do with cost considerations, high patient numbers and, and, and a shortage of human and material resources. And believe me, human resources are way more important than material resources. It's the people that, that are at the very center of everything. And, and, and to me, the nurse is the most important. The second element is keeping costs down. And here I would talk about our cath lab. So I think if you look at the cardiac catheterization, the costs are high because we have high equipment, long procedure times, low case load, large number of you know, inventory that is required, expensive devices, and we need dedicated personnel. So how did we address that? We've adapted to single plane. And it's been a problem, I mean, it's a problem when you perforate the right ventricle outflow tract, but by and large you can manage. We address long procedure times by really maximizing planning and actually doing targeted procedures with simplified strategies. We share the cath lab with an adult facility, so we address the issue of low case loads, we re-sterilize hardware, it's extremely hardware conscious, use a lot of adult hardware in pediatric interventions, I'll show you examples. We improvise with alternatives to expensive devices, use inexpensive devices, develop our own indigenous technology, and then we multitask uh, with personnel, we have sedation protocols that reduce the need for anesthesiologists, etc., etc. So here's an example of how we prepare our babies without anesthesia. It looks cruel, but it is actually not so because we have this very comfortable restraints that we hold the babies in. It enables easy access and avoids the need for anesthesia in every baby uh, by providing sedation, carefully monitored sedation using these protocols. We don't do TE in all ASDs. So we can actually target our TEs to those ASDs that need them. So we spend a lot of time planning the procedure and we are the same ones doing the imaging as well as doing the procedure, it becomes rather easy. So here are three examples. If you take this AST that is having a deficient posterior rim, you anticipate problems, so you do it under TE. This is something that you would send to surgery, there are no posterior, there's no posterior rim, and this is a straight shot ASD, we would do it under transthoracic. So you save time in the lab, you avoid anesthesia, you're able to move things much faster by doing this kind of pre-procedure planning. Another example is ductal stenting. We had a wonderful talk yesterday. Again, we really plan the procedure to the, to the smallest detail in the echo room and decide our access, for example, uh, as I'm showing you in these examples that I'm, that I'm in, uh, uh, demonstrating out here. Adult hardware are a boon to pediatric newborn interventions, and I'm going to show you some examples. Coronary wires, we've gotten familiar by partnering with our adult colleagues. It just helps us do a lot, and really understanding this hardware makes a big difference. And these are some examples of uh, hardware, the Whisper, the BMW, the floppy high talk floppy wire, the Fielder FC that allows perforation in specific circumstances. And here's an example of where Fielder FC was very useful. This is my adult colleague that helped me do this case. This is a child with a completely occluded duct who a newborn BT shunt would have been far more challenging because we just didn't have ICU bed space. So we were able to then perforate this uh, or actually go through this, recanalize this duct with a fielder FC CTO wire, chronic total occlusion wire, again guided with the help of uh, uh, my adult colleague. Uh, and what I have is a long cook sheet with a cut pigtail at the end of it and that enables us to cross this and then of course enables us to then eventually stent this duct uh, rather effectively and then send the baby out of the hospital within two to three days as against a much longer stay if we had to do a BT shunt in this uh, situation. Uh, I like this example that, that I'm going to show you in the next slide even better. So here's a patient who had a uh, pulmonary atresia with intact ventricular septum and where we again use the coronary hardware 
And what we did was to place the right, front RF, uh, right uh, coronary artery guiding catheter, 5 French, in the RVOT, then put in the coronary microcatheter that lets you very precisely place the wire catheter just below the valve and then perforate with a Conquest Pro, which is a wire for CTO, and catch it with a snare on the opposite side, which you can uh, place to be ready because we don't have biplane. I find this much easier to make sure that we've gone through the, the valve. And then, of course, uh, proceed in the same sitting to stent the duct as well because you often find that it's so difficult to ensure adequate saturation. You can always test a clue uh, before you do that. RVOT stenting, again, we've got away with lots of coronary hardware, guiding catheters, everything is coronary here, uh, and, and the stents as well. So the other very important element in our environment is to train people. So you have to build training systems. Building capacity at all levels um, of caregivers is tremendously important. And that's one thing we feel very proud about. And these are people trained in my, I mean, just a snapshot of some of the people, cardiologists trained in my program. But we've been able to train pro cardiologists from elsewhere as well. So this is a picture of Sri Lanka, uh, cardiologists from Sri Lanka who really the entire cardio as cardiology team uh, the core of the cardiology team in Sri Lanka were trained at my institution and they have actually gone way ahead of us in terms of numbers. They do many more catheterizations than we do. So this has a tremendous uh, amplification effect. So training to us is an incredibly important goal. Then very important aspect is to find ways to fund care. I think this is very frustrating because you know we did a study which we looked at our expense in terms of uh, annual income of the family and we found that it's approximately 90 to 100 percent of the annual income of families. So it was really, really having an impact on their livelihood, on their life and many of these families were devastated by the pediatric cardiac surgery. So this was something that uh, triggered us to partner with a number of foundations from both within India and outside and this of course has been my main mission lately in finding ways to fund individual patients. It's very frustrating, very challenging, but sometimes often very rewarding as well. So this, uh, to me, is incredibly important because there are very good hearts everywhere. It's just a question of finding a way to, to, to tap them. And finally, getting the government on board. And I think this has been the pinnacle of what we have accomplished uh, in our state because we've advocated for this over the years. And with persistent advocacy, we've really finally woken up the government. It's like an elephant that takes a while to get up, but once it gets up, the momentum is phenomenal. And so here, what we said was, let's focus on infants and newborns. Let's use pediatric cardiac surgery to bring down infant mortality in our region to below 10. We will called it a single digit IMR initiative. And then we tried and strengthened every aspect of health systems, educating primary caregivers, and then through a public-private partnership with good participation from our uh, government with uh, particularly the minister, the health secretary, we were able to then put together a program that has really accomplished a great deal. Uh, with this program called Hridayam, which means heart in the state of Kerala, we now are able to access almost every child with heart disease and nobody is denied. So we've got registrations actually which is now going up to 7,000. I just checked the website and we were able to do uh, in seven centers, a large number of patients. So I think I'll conclude by saying that pediatric heart care in low resource environment needs to integrate three concepts of healthcare, which is it has to be cost effective, it has to be driven with good outcomes, you can't have sustainable care without good outcomes, so you need very good quality improvement initiatives built in and you have to have access. You need to think of the average child in the region, which means that you have to have the willingness to connect with people and understand the livelihood of people, you have to multitask, you have to have an inclusive definition of progress. Progress should not be defined by doing the most fancy procedures. In my opinion, progress is if what percentage of children in your region have access to care. That is the ultimate definition of progress. Not doing some fancy procedure, not doing Norwoods, not doing, not having it more. That's not progress. So you got to have a different way of looking at it. Simple things, infection control, nurse training and empowerment, ICU protocols, surgical checklists, staff retention, cohesive teamwork, they have a tremendous impact, the biggest impact on outcomes, way bigger than any of the high-tech solutions that you can bring in. 
improvisations, innovations, indige indigenous technology, very important for the future. And then the most important thing is not to accept new technology without proof of incremental benefit. 3D Echo is a good example. How much does it truly impact outcomes? It's, it's driven up the overheads of an echo machine to a ridiculous level. But actually, if you really ask the question, it may not make a big difference. So essentially, it's all this coming together. Then, of course, you have to tailor solutions based on socioeconomic realities. And with that, I think you can make a difference. But the, re the important thing is to think broadly, think, think of the population, think of the average child in the region. Thank you. Thank you.